All right, welcome to my educational autobiography PowerPoint. My name is Sam, so I wanted to make a narrated PowerPoint because this is my fifth class of TCNJ, so I wanted to do something a little bit different for the autobiography. And I just learned how to do this skill last class with uh, Professor Stewart, so I thought it'd be kind of fun to do some more of it. All right, so it all started when I was born. I was born in Syracuse, New York, and I have a small family. My father is a computer consultant, and my mom was an occupational therapist, and I have a younger sister. When I was in about like four years old, I moved to Florida, where I spent the rest of my childhood and adolescence. I went to elementary school, middle school, and high school, all in South Florida. And um, yeah, I was told I was a relatively difficult child and a <laughs> bit of an angry child. So uh, perhaps I was a bit difficult to, for the teachers and maybe for my mom too. So <laughs> hopefully I've made up for it by then. So my early education was at a Jewish preschool. So I got pretty used to being in a religious setting during school. So then when I was in kindergarten and elementary school and I moved to a public school, things were a little bit different and I had to learn how to be in a setting that I had a very diverse classmates. I grew up in a pretty diverse area, so that was something I had to transition into, which I think was obviously for the better, and I definitely benefited from being in a really trend, uh, really multinational and multi-diverse school setting. So uh, I think a trend that I experienced when I was in lower elementary school, elementary school, was the, that trend that teachers would put their kids into reading groups. So I can remember my class was divided into three groups. I think it was like the blue group, the green group, and the orange group. And it was uh, something like the orange group was the, the lowest reading ability, and I was in that group. So I think it was a little bit detrimental to self-esteem to be divided by your reading ability and then put with all the other kids who also don't know how to read that well. So I, I think it might have been a little bit better if the groups were divided evenly instead of very segregationally, because then you could be with kids who can learn and you could learn from them. So in my early education, I think another big trend was the when I when I was in elementary school, it was kind of a I was a bit of the first generation that their whole education was designed with standardized tests in mind. Because the SAT enrolled was unveiled in the, I think nineteen eighty six. So from when I was in elementary school and onward, school was pretty much all about test taking. So that was pretty much the goal behind learning anything. And yeah, it definitely led to the, the, the student class being divided by good test takers and bad test takers. So I think I was a good test taker, but I, I, was, I was more so good at memorizing things for the test and then forgetting them. So I don't know how successful it was in that regards. Not to say I didn't learn anything, but I, I would say most things that I learned were probably for the goal of being tested on it. I think when I was in elementary school as well, Another big trend was the, the rampant diagnosis of ADHD, myself included. So, I mean, I could remember being in school and there being a line down the hallway at the nurse's office for kids trying to take their ADHD pills. So that was another big trend in my high school, or my high school, elementary school, and middle school years. I don't know, some people will probably disagree with me saying that it's a trend, but... I don't know, I'd probably say it's a bit of a trend just because there were so many kids who probably weren't even actually actually had ADHD. They were just being diagnosed because they had a lot of energy or they were just too happy or something. But uh, yeah, so that was probably another trend that was present in my early education. <clears throat> so middle school and high school were a little bit uninspiring for me. I got into trouble a lot just because I was pretty rambunctious and pretty high energy. So, um, yeah, I, I was pretty good at taking tests, so I maintained high grades, but I was also pretty difficult for the teachers, and I don't know, I would probably say I was more inspired by things I would do in my own time than things that I would be doing at school. I was part of a culinary team, of all things, so that was pretty, that was probably the most inspiring thing for me in high school, being on a team and being able to practice something artistic that I really enjoyed doing. I was also pretty into art as well during high school, so all the hobbies and the interests that I had on my own terms were a lot more interesting and a lot more inspiring than school itself. 
so then I transferred to, so then when I got into college, it was also a bit turbulent, which is, I guess, a theme throughout my entire education. My undergraduate years, I transferred schools four times. I changed majors three times. I started at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. Then I wanted to go to UCF, uh, University of Central Florida, but through a system of convolutions, I ended up having to go to two different community colleges in between. And uh, I started university as an art major, and then I was convinced by my father and by the guidance counselors that being an art major isn't very useful. So then I transferred to being a business major, and that was just way too different for me, and I couldn't get into that. So then I transferred again to being a hospitality and tourism major, which was not extremely different from being a business major, but at that point my scholarship was running out and I couldn't afford to change majors again. So that was what I finished my schooling with. And um, I mean, it provided some opportunities, but I would say I knew from the beginning that working at a hotel was not something that I wanted to do with my life. So yeah, I mean, it was, it was interesting to some degree. I enjoyed taking marketing classes. I enjoyed taking global politics classes and hospitality classes, but I would say that the overarching themes of the major being business and being hospitality management were just not the path that I could see myself going down for the rest of my life. So after college, I took a brief little self-discovery trip to Europe for a few months where I backpacked by myself to about 15 different countries in a four month period. So that was fun and crazy and probably something I needed at the time. And then when I got back from Europe, I didn't want to stay in Florida anymore. So I packed all my things into my car and drove from South Florida to Seattle, Washington, where I spent the next two years. I got a job doing sales. I was a sales consultant for a large timeshare company. So, um, as you can see by the next bullet point, that was not satisfying. So, uh, it was okay. Like, I, I enjoyed living in Seattle. I enjoyed the nature and the Pacific Northwest vibes. But, um, yeah, selling timeshares was... <laughs> it wasn't... It wasn't inspirational, much like a lot of the schooling I had before. So I, I actually ended up meeting someone who had just come back from teaching in Taipei for, like, four or five years. And she was saying, she was like, oh, you're so young, you should go do something fun with your time. You should just go live in Asia for a couple years, and maybe you'll like teaching. So that's what I did. I, I went to school, or I, I went to a school in Asia where I started teaching at the kindergarten level, and I actually really loved it, like, right away. And um, that was probably the first job that I had where I felt really inspired by what I was doing, and I could immediately see myself doing this for a really long time perhaps as my entire career. So that's when it comes to me moving to Taiwan. So I moved here on a whim, as I just said, and uh, yeah, it was, it was really inspiring really quickly. I, I work for what's called a Bushiban, which is a after-school subsidiary English learning program where kids go to after they finish their day school. And um, yeah, so it... I've been there, I've been at the same Bushi Bond for the last four years, so there's there's definitely some challenges with it. I would say one of the biggest challenges is just that the curriculum is so compact and so regimented. It's like in my teacher's guide, it says, from 4.30 till 4.35, do this. From thir from 4.35 to 4.37, do this. So it's, a, it's quite challenging to have, to teach in that sort of paint by numbers, check the boxes kind of style. So, um... I knew I really liked teaching, and I liked interacting with kids, and I liked building a rapport with the kids, and planning my lessons out the way I enjoy teaching. So I, I came across the TCNJ system, I had a friend who had completed it, and she really highly recommended it, so I enrolled myself, and I've been in it since January, and like I said at the beginning, this is my fifth course. So uh, yeah, it's been really inspiring to be a TCNJ student, and learn some some formal educational background because I don't have any of that from my prior experience. So that's been a really interesting experience for me in my teaching as well here in Taiwan. So the next five years, a bit of a challenging question. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, I just got a new position that I'll be starting this coming August. So 
I'll be doing homeroom teaching in a third grade classroom. So I'm pretty excited for that. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to develop as a professional educator and uh, move away from the Bushiban sector in Taiwan. I would love to eventually move into the international school sector. And hopefully once this uh, pandemic clears up some more, we can get back to our daily lives and I and our passions. Uh, my, I have a big passion of traveling, so that would be something that I'm looking forward to in the next five years as well, in, in addition to my educational future. So what's made the journey worthwhile? Uh, I would say definitely connecting with the students and learning how to have a relationship with students and with kids. Before I came to Taiwan, I never really had to work with kids. So it's been really interesting and really, really great to get to have that experience. And also learning about Taiwanese culture itself. I've really fell in love with the culture. I've really fell in love with living here. I could definitely see myself living here for a long time. And uh, I think probably the biggest thing that's made the journey worthwhile is being a student myself. Being able to also be learning while teaching has been something that's been really eye-opening and giving me a lot of insight as to what it's like to be a student while being a teacher. I've been studying Chinese for a couple years since I've been in Taiwan, and um, since January I've been a TCNJ student, so it's really been giving me a lot of insight as to how to be a student again while being a teacher, a relatively new teacher. So um, so yeah, I mean also the, the potential future of my career has been another thing that's made the journey worthwhile. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the end of my presentation. I, I hope it wasn't too long, and uh, I hope you learned what you needed to learn from it. And, um, yeah, I'm really excited to get to know Professor Cap and Professor Madden and all of the new classmates and reconnect with some of the classmates I just met in the previous course with Professor Carroll. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot.